Good evening, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome back to SF Commons. Tonight, we have a very special show. As we know, the congressional elections are looming. In 2018, we will witness uh, the House of Representatives uh, election for all of the members of the House of Representatives. There are 30, 33 seats um, in the U.S. Senate that's up for election, re-election. So now is the time for us, the public, to really look at what's happening in Congress, what's happening in our country, and to seriously look at whether or not the people we now have in power are representing us, and how our day-to-day -day lives, how our lives are impacted by decisions being made by people in power and people who have been elected and have been in these same offices for 30, 40 years. So, ladies and gentlemen, I would like to introduce Lauren Steiner, host of the Robust Opposition, also one of the organizers of this protest for our revolution, Los Angeles. We are here with folks from Indivisible outside of Dianne Feinstein's fundraiser here in Hancock Park. The guests are arriving. We are out here asking her to hold a town hall. She's never held a town hall in her 24 years of being a senator. We are here to tell her that she needs to see us, she needs to hear us, because I don't think she understands us. Yeah. No, I agree. So, in fact, there's going to be there's going to be another fundraiser tomorrow in Bel Air. So let's let's go with this chant. Senator Feinstein, show us that you care. Or tomorrow, see you in Bel Air. Senator <laughs> Feinstein, show us that you care. Or tomorrow, see you in Bel Air. So I've been able to observe Diane Feinstein the whole time she's been in office. She's been liberal on some issues, gay rights, women's rights, gun control, but on issues where she's had to choose between siding behind working people versus corporations and the 1%, she usually sides with the 1%. Boo! No! She has voted for the Iraq War, Boo! where thousands of mostly poor Americans, because that's who fights in our wars yep. these days, folks, yep. Yep. have been killed maimed or afflicted with PTSD or traumatic brain disorders. She voted for the extension of the Patriot Act and the FISA provisions, <laughs> allowing government to spy on us, and called Edward Snowden, who disclosed these, pro these programs, a traitor. <laughs> she voted for the bankruptcy bill, where people are actually required to pay their credit card companies before they pay their child support. Oh. And she voted to fast track the Trans Pacific Partnership, the corporate trade deal, which has been called NAFTA on steroids. Oh. Uh, she's been there for 24 years. Okay. Um, I don't believe that Feinstein represents California. I don't believe she represents the working class, and I don't believe she represents the Democratic Party. So uh, a lot of her positions are actually against the Democratic Party platform. Mm -hmm. A lot of people aren't aware of her voting record because I believe in the past a lot of people weren't as into elections and the electoral process as they should have been. And now they're coming to realize what she has voted for in the past. A lot of people are surprised that she, to know that she voted for the Iraq War, the Patriot Act, and, and military funding. I mean, it's, it's pretty clear now with her votes recently that she's made that she's more of a conservative than anything. Um, she voted for a $700 billion war budget for Donald Trump while he's threatening other countries to go to war. That's more than he wanted. So he, she uh, also voted for half of his cabinet nominees and wouldn't stop voting for them until people were outside her house and outside her offices and protesting. So what I bring to the table is an option on the ballot for people who are tired of the same old status quo they're tired of wars, they're tired of corporations buying off their candidates and their representatives in office. So I'm not accepting any corporate donations. I come from a working class background and I've also had six years experience as a legislative analyst. Yep. Basically, I started work very early in life. Um, when I was about 13, I was already helping like around the house and I don't mean helping around the house like washing dishes and stuff. You know, like digging trenches in the yard to lay, lay down pipe and plumbing and sprinkler systems. 
When I was 15, I was working for my neighbor pouring concrete for minimum wage. So I've been in the workforce since I was 15 years old, getting paid for it. Um, that was back when we had work permits and whatnot, that we could do that at the time. So from that point on, I mean, I've never, besides being unemployed for six months, uh, one time I've never left the, the workplace, basically. I've always worked in some type of job. Um, I've worked in mental health. I did that for four years. I worked a lot of different construction jobs, paving stones, uh, framing, a little bit of roofing, uh, a lot of different things, basically, pouring concrete. I've driven forklift. I've dri driven delivery trucks. So I've, I've basically done a lot of different jobs um, that, that basically are working class jobs. And there's a lot of similarities um, between them. I work both public and private sector, and there's a lot of similarities, more than you'd think between them. Uh, so the last six years, I've actually been a legislative analyst. Uh, I, I work for transportation or work on transportation issues. So that's kind of my my you know focus right now. So I, I know the legislative system. I know how stuff operates. It's a little different on the federal level, but not that much. So I already have the experience that I can go forward. Your average candidate does not have that experience. They're usually uh, someone who's wealthy who can fund their own campaign basically and doesn't have to work a day job so they don't have that experience and they've separated themselves from from us basically the people who actually have to go work an eight to five job so that's what I like I was mentioning before that's what I really feel that I bring is that experience I'm I'm like literally working right now full-time as I run this campaign what are the first things that you're going to change or you, tr you try to you'll try to advocate for so uh, one of the first things I think we need to fight for is single-payer health care. Uh -huh. um, that's a huge deal right and now. And Senator Feinstein does not believe in that. Correct. Senator Feinstein says that single-payer is a government takeover of all medicine. Mm -hmm. So she does not want single-payer to pass. She also collects hundreds of thousands of dollars from the health care insurance industry and pharmaceutical companies. So there's there's a correlation there, obviously. Um, I'm I'm been... I've basically supported single payer for 10 years. I debated it in junior college and mm -hmm. in college. Uh, when Bernie came out to uh, run for president, and one of his issues was single payer, that got me on board more than anything else. Right, right. Because I've been fighting for this issue for so long. So I jumped on board with the campaign. I was working full time then as well, doing the same job I am now. And then I would go to the Bernie Sanders campaign office in Sacramento and work an additional eight hours. My concern, I'm going to be retiring soon. My, my concern is Medicare and Social Security. But I'm also concerned about affordable care, health care. And I think the recent bill that was proposed was an abortion to not do a point, but I think it was ridiculous. So here's my question. There's going to be um, a proposal by uh, Senator Sanders. Um, yeah. Supposedly it's coming up later this month. It's basically single payer. I, I, I don't know the details of it. I've read how he feels about things, so I have an idea. And you probably don't know the details either. I but, don't. But my question is, how, how are you going to help support single payer? Because all of the proposals and the reworks that have been coming up with health care right now basically are just helping the health insurance industry. People like me, people like my children, and the healthcare people who provide healthcare, the doctors and the uh, medical facilities, the nurses, etc., are not getting any breaks. But the healthcare industry is getting all the breaks. So, my question again how are you going to help support single payer healthcare? Well. going to mean complete takeover by the government of all health care. Yes. So the working class hasn't received a wage and or a wage increase in 50 years. During that time all that money that we used to make has gone to the 1% and it's getting worse and worse. This new tax reform plan, quote unquote, that's actually going to shift that even further. So in one way, I think that it's actually an opportunity because I think that it'll really wake people up to realize what is actually going on in our political system and how little some of our politicians are doing. So we have this tax reform bill going down that's going to hurt so many people and we now will see 
who actually votes against it. So as I mentioned in the past, Dianne Feinstein has made a lot of surprising votes. And I would not be surprised if she ends up being bipartisan, as she likes to say, and voting for this bill. I wouldn't be surprised if she didn't either, because the spotlight's basically on her now with this uh, election coming up. And basically our campaign and other campaigns, you know, progressive campaigns, are getting a lot of, of, of media um, and getting a lot of attention because of that. So obviously the Republicans are out to get more money for their corporate donors, but when you have the same corporate donors donating to Democrats, exactly. then we have the same problem. Exactly, exactly. So um, Dianne Feinstein is one of the senators who have always voted for the wars. Mm -hmm. If you look at, uh, basically I call them corporate politicians, because if you look at their donation records, you'll see who's actually funding them for re-election. Dianne Feinstein, of her top ten donors, three of them are military industrial complex donors. Two of them are drone manufacturers. So she makes money whenever she passes an arms bill to, say, to fund Saudi Arabia to attack Yemen. She makes money off of that. So this is what she does. The other uh, interest groups that you mentioned, banks and others, they make money off this as well. So she's keeping that, that system going where basically we are bombing people and causing bloodshed in other countries, either directly or indirectly, for profit. So I'm an anti-war candidate. I'm against going to war against other nations for profit for any reason other than our defense. And I don't see how we can defend ourselves. It has bases, hundreds of bases in the Middle East, uh, hundreds of bases in addition to that around the world. We've been operating as the global police, which is not our role. Well, I, I believe we need to pull back, shut a lot of those bases, bring the troops home and focus on actual defense. So if we had a missile system, like actually in places, if we had spent all that money that we've spent on all these wars on an, an, a missile system, then we could defend our own country from home and North Korea wouldn't even be a threat we would like literally be laughing at North Korea right now. We wouldn't be in any fear of getting hit by a nuclear missile from North Korea because we'd just shoot them down. So, so this is the issue we're facing is we're, we're funding so many offensive wars and going and killing so many innocent people that we've lost our defensive capabilities. If we actually funded our defensive capabilities, there would be no threat when it comes to countries, rogue nations and other countries. Well, what do you think about you know, the student loans? Mm -hmm. There's trillions of dollars. Innocent loans. The uh, school, uh, basically, I like to give a little backstory of my school like history and my history of working through college. So, I basically I worked full time or more because for some of the time I had two part time jobs that I was actually working 60 hours a week to pay for school as I attended school. So, I actually graduated debt free. So some people might pile on and say, see, that's possible. You can just work and graduate and, you know, stop being lazy. That's not the case anymore. I graduated at the time when the first tuition rate hike went in. So now it's no longer a possibility to work a full-time job or even more and pay for school and pay it off before you leave school. So instead of raising tuition rates and then having loan companies, and some of them private loan companies pay those tuition rates and then charge rates to these students so they're in enormous amounts of debt, we should be attacking the cause of the problem, which is the tuition rates themselves. We don't need to fund administrations at the levels we're funding them at. We need to fund student services and education. That's the whole point of schools. So I'm for uh, what they call the Robin Hood uh, tax. I've rebranded it the Patriot tax. Basically, you put a, a small fraction of a percent tax on trades on Wall Street. Um, they call it the Robin Hood tax, but you know the mantra is still from the rich give to the poor. We're not stealing. They're paying it back. They're giving us, you know, what we need as a country to push our education system forward and have a skilled workforce. So what's more patriotic than that? So I'm calling it the Patriot Tax. So we need to fund, you know, to get these students, you know, through school on a tuition-free basis. Um, also, I'm for tuition-free trade schools. Not everyone needs to go to university. I actually come from a family of union carpenters, millwrights, and metal workers. So these, these uh, like my uncles and my dad, they all you know, have great jobs doing construction and they retired off those jobs. My dad hasn't retired yet, but he's about to. And these are actually quality jobs where they actually made a very good living. Mechanics and and, and we need them money. too. I liked, you know, even when I was growing up, when we bought stuff, I could fix stuff myself in my house. For, for the most part, you can <clears> still work on your own cars. I mean, they're getting so highly technical that that's not really the case anymore. 
But I've been under the hood of my car several times. I've, I've done everything to a car except anything inside the engine. I've dropped a transmission out of a car. I've, I've redone the whole rear end suspension in a car. I've changed fuel pumps. I've changed out alternators, AC components. So I've done all this stuff myself growing up. So, you know, this is not stuff that we can do at home as much anymore with newer cars, but stuff that I had to do at the time because I didn't have an option to pay yeah. somebody else. Well, let's, let's talk about um, your, your strategy. Um, is this the first time you're, if you've ran for office? Yes, it is. How, how do you like it so far? So it's very busy. Um, we are running a grassroots campaign. So, so basically what we have right now is we have volunteers across the state. I have people all the way up in Northern California in Siskiyou County, all the way down to San Diego County, already working on a volunteer basis, handing out flyers and talking to everybody in their areas. Um, you can jump on the website, davidforcalifornia.com, and get a free bumper sticker. We're sending those out. So those have gone out across the state as well. Right. Um, I actually just drove up part last night and part this morning from LA. I stayed in Coalinga last night. I was in Ventura in LA over the last couple of days and I was also in LA last week and San Francisco last week. Now I'm back in San Francisco. Tomorrow I'm going to be in Vallejo. Oh, so Jesus. Uh, I have been everywhere. So we, we are very serious about this campaign. We have a lot of volunteers that are very serious and putting in a lot of work. Every single person on my campaign is fired up and is doing this as a volunteer because we literally do not have the money to, you know, launch a huge campaign and hire all these consultants and campaign managers and all these people. My media guy is actually working for free. My treasurer is working for free because we feel that there is this change that needs to happen. And we can't do it the way that, that corporate candidates can because we're not accepting hundred or thousand dollar a plate dinners you know, we're not having those kind of fundraisers because we don't want their money. We don't want corporate money. We want the people to be represented. And if we go and follow the same pattern that everyone else has, the people will never be represented. This is, this is very exciting. Uh, you've been able to tap into the Bernie Sanders mm -hmm. uh, campaign, 2016 campaign, because there's a lot of volunteers there. You work in that campaign. So, yeah, so you I have mentioned it built before. In. So basically across the state, there's uh, Bernie Sanders volunteers. There is actually 300,000 volunteers in California alone for the Bernie campaign. Exactly. So if we could just get a fraction of those people on board volunteering for our campaign, we could actually defeat one of the highest paid senators in California. <laughs> one so of the most right powerful. Now, yeah, one of the most powerful. So right now we're just, you know, we're in the beginning phases of doing that and we're seeing those exact people jumping on board. So it's very exciting to get that traction and get people involved. What we've been promoting is we've been promoting the idea of small donations. Exactly. And, uh, and so we're doing this all like through independent donations, just like Bernie did. So we already know that it's possible, but it's very early for some people to donate. So we really need to get the word out more is what we're working on right now, which is why we're going around the state and saying, listen, this is a serious challenge against Feinstein. We don't have the resources to do things the same way, but I'm actually enjoying it this way. This way we can show people that we're actually serious about representing the working class. Because if we're going out there saying, you know, we represent the working class and then, you know, we're collecting money from Chevron or Comcast or all these other places where people always collect money from, how are we going to turn around and say we're representing anyone? So the, with the Bernie volunteers, there's 300,000 Bernie volunteers, not donors. Those were just the volunteers. Exactly. Those are the people the that took the extra step to volunteer. <laughs> so there's even more donors. I don't even have a number for that, but it's way more than 300,000. So, I mean, we, we know the numbers are out there. Um, the holiday season is generally slow for electoral politics. So we're not really looking forward to that, but at the same time, this is exactly the time we need people to get involved. Exactly. So, I mean, this has been, this is really exciting, you know, uh, that um, a lot of people are moving, are stepping forward. Mm -hmm. Basically, we're filling up the schedule with events and we're heading all over the state. I'll be back in L.A. again in a month in the L.A. area, so, and maybe even before that, depending on what, what comes up. So. We're really pushing hard to get the word out there. And like I mentioned before, you know, a lot of people in politics, they were asleep or they were cynical. They didn't want to vote because it was the same people all the time or the, the same donors all the time funding these campaigns and funding these candidates. This is the chance to do it. So I, while I understand the skepticism, the cynicism, and I, you know, had that myself in the past when I saw, you know, you know years ago, the same kind of candidates, the same donors, it, it makes you not want to vote. But when you have someone step forward 
like many candidates are this cycle and say, listen, I'm not taking corporate donations and we're going to we're going to fight for this and we're going to see what happens. That's when we need people to jump on board. So while I, like I said, while I understand the cynicism and the holding back, we really need to get people involved and jump on board now if we're actually going to take people down. The midterm election is actually generally statistically it's it's not as big of a voter turnout. So that's actually a chance for us, because if we can turn out people on our side, we can actually win a lot of these elections for progressives and people who fight for the working class. And we can actually you know, win seats in the House and Senate and, and make changes, like actual on the ground changes for the working class. And once that goes forward, that'll start a wave across the rest of the nation where more people who actually represent the people can get into office. Our government's meant to represent us, and it hasn't done that for decades. Some people argue it hasn't done that forever with a few, you know, hiccups in between. So, I mean, I think we should go back to the FDR time period, you know, and, and have a new Bill of Rights and actually support the people because that's what the government's there for. It's not there to be, you know, the puppet of corporations and do their bidding. <coughs> it's there to represent the people. So go to his website, uh, David Hildebrand's website, which we have. It will be posting uh, in this show. And uh, ladies and gentlemen, um, Again, thank you so much for joining us, and good night.